Good afternoon. I hope the neurons are still firing in the brain of everyone here, <laughs> being the last speaker. I first would like to thank uh, the organizer and Beat who invited me to this uh, fantastic uh, conference. So as my title will say, we are going to turn on to the hippocampus a little bit longer today. And um, let me see if it's working, yes. And as everybody knows, the hippocampus has been very well known for its role in memory and very specific uh, aspect of memory, mainly what we call in animal literature relational or special memory because we cannot measure really episodic of declarative memory, but in human also on declarative and autobiographical memories. But we have learned also that the hippocampus is very important for the regulation of emotion for the stress reactivity and its active uh, action on the regulation of the HPA axis. One other thing that we have learned is that the hippocampus is very uh, vulnerable early in age, vulnerable to hypoxic inf uh, event, uh, ischemic event, stress related event. We just learned it, you know, with the rodents. So it is a, a very uh, important structure to study across development. And also because this vulner vulnerability of the hippocampus has been linked to many developmental disorders in human, as I have uh, tried to portray here in this uh, slide. So the question that we have asked in our research program, because we did not know uh, uh, a lot of literature on the development of the hippocampus, both morphologically and functionally. So we wanted to start looking up. We would like we wanted to start looking at this uh, development in in the monkeys, and also to study what are the consequences of not having a, a functional hippocampus very early in life, and see you know if these. Uh, uh, insult will not only impact a function that are supported by the hippocampus, but function that are also supported by area of the brain that are related to the net network uh, of, the hippocampal, of the hippocampus. And of course, the goal is what could all of this you know, tell us about neuropsychiatric disorders, and I'm not going to spend too much time, unfortunately, in this short period of time. So this is uh, the approach. We use two groups of animals in the, that I'm going to present today. They are the sham operated control. They are males and females in a two group. The other one receives neurotoxic lesion of the hippocampus when they are very young, around 10 to 12 days of age. This is how we can look at the lesion a week after uh, the injection, where you can see some uh, hyper signals here using some T2 images and the resulting shrink shrinkage of the hippocampus when you redo an MRI a year later. So this is not gentle uh, uh, dysfunction. This is really, uh, so we have also to keep that in mind when we look at the data. So uh, these animals, of course, have been tested from oh, uh, the four weeks after they receive their uh, surgery all the way to eight years. And this is all of the function that we have tried to look on this animal as much as we could across development. Today, I'm just going to cover what I've highlighted in yellow here, some function that are known to be mediated by the hippocampus, some working memory function, uh, supported by the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. If I have time, I will go on some uh, of the stress uh, changes that we see in this animal and some of the brain changes that we are starting to get out of these uh, animals. So just to put everybody on the same page here, I just wanted to go over the circuitry of the hippocampus. It's quite an interesting system. Uh, the, the hippocampus receives all of its input from a cortical area that are just adjacent to it, like the entorhinal and the perirhinal cortex and the parhippocampal gyrus. And this uh, information funnel into the hippocampus via two a very important pathway. One is a very well-known trisynactic pathway where the information go to the dentate and they go by stages from the CA3, CA2, CA1, subiculum and back to the cortex. But there is also a very shortcut, a more direct pathway that go directly from the entorhinal cortex to the CA1 and back out. 
So one of the questions that we wanted to know is, first of all, what is the development of uh, the morphological development of the hippocampus in monkeys? And uh, the, some recent study that have done by the group of Amaral and Avenex looking more in detail of what's changing during this developmental period. So, the, uh, so also I wanted to point out because it is going to uh, be uh, important for the remaining of my talk. We know that from old study by uh, late uh, Pat Goldman using two deoxyglucose technique that uh, monkey uh, that were trained on special tasks, they show activity in a trisynaptic pathway, whereas those that were tested on object memory tasks, they showed some activation of this very direct pathway here. So these two pathways seems to support different uh, memory function in, in, in primate. And the idea was how these uh, two set of memory uh, develop uh, in, in the monkeys. So this is, first of all, for the morphology, this is on the same animal when we follow them across age. So it's a longitudinal study looking at volumetric uh, measure of the hippocampus across age for males and females. And you can see that the, this very steep increase in volume all the way to year one, and then a much moderate increase all the way to two to three years of age. What's, if, this is quite uh, similar to what uh, Jay has shown in, in human. And also what we um, uh, can see here that while there is no sex differences here in a female, we saw that the left and right uh, hippocampi were different uh, in volume in, uh, on the males. Now, these uh, changes here that occur very early in life and continue all the way to two years, uh, the group of uh, Amaral and Lavernex, and I just speak only one example because they have uh, many uh, data in this, their paper, they show that, so here is the volume of the different fields of the hippocampus across age in the monkeys. And this is the adult, 100% level here. And you can see that different fields mature at different time. So that C1 field uh, uh, reach maturity very quickly around one year of age, whereas the dentate gyrus and the C3 takes much longer because by one year, they are not yet at the level of, of the adults. So uh, with this in mind, we wanted to see if object recognition memory that is supported by the direct pathway and supported the C1 field may be emerging earlier than these uh, uh, relational memory processes. So we tested this animal on some tasks that I've uh, used for many years that are quite uh, fantastic to look at developmental uh, cognitive process in the monkeys. So the task is very simple. It's, uh, the am animal is familiarized with the stimuli and then at different delay is presented with a novel and the familiar stimuli. And we are just looking at how long they are looking at the novel stimuli. And you have seen that in a rodent by exploring, this is exactly the same principle. We are looking at incidental recognition memory, how long, and all mammals are going to do this task, looking to know what she preferentially than familiarity. So if we uh, look at the normal control across the age, you can see that at one month, all of the animals the animal, the control animal, show very robust uh, preference for novelty at all delays. These, this uh, novelty preference increase a little bit at six months, but also remain uh, quite stable across all delay. It's only when the animal were retested at 18 months that you see the adult pattern where they show a delay dependent effect, where they are better when you use a short delay but worse when uh, they are uh, given longer delays. So uh, this was interesting because um, uh, many uh, paper in the literature at the time suggested that this type of memory that you can also demonstrate in human, human, human infant occurring very early in life may be dependent on the hippocampus because the hippocampus was thought at the time that he was fully developed at birth in a primates. 
So to test this, we look at what the animal with hippocampal lesion will do on this task. And this is what we find. So this animal with the neonatal hippocampal lesion perform comparably to the control for the first month and six months, but arriving at six, 18 months, they give exactly the same pattern that if you would have done an, an, uh, the same lesion in an adult. Meaning they are going to perform very well at the short delay, but then their performance declined at the longest delay. So this is, was interesting because he was telling us that there is something in a circuit that is changing during this period of, uh, from the birth to the first year. And what was interesting is this performance here was not supported by the hippocampus, meant that there were some other structures that were able at this younger age to support this function. And I don't know if I kept this slide, yes I did, <laughs> where we have another group of animals that have received perirhinal lesion at birth, the same way, t tested the same way, and here you can see that they start to decline, their memory declines very early on, and in fact increase the, the severity of their problem increase with age. So this uh, finding uh, is interesting because they show that there is a lot of uh, reorganization in the medial temporal lobe in uh, the type of memory function the different areas support. Okay. All right, so now that I have, uh, so the idea was that maybe this recognition memory that uh, um, uh, develop around the first year of age, uh, what will happen with a relational memory? So for this, we just wanted to use the same task because it allows us to test very young baby monkeys, but we had to make a task that really assess <clears throat> special memory in, in monkeys. And so what we did is there, the, the comparison, sorry, I'm just always hitting the wrong button here. The comparison here is an image with five little item. And the novel image, the item are exactly the same, but three of them have changed location. So now the animal has to remember the location of each item against the other one. And because um, the, the picture were a little bit more complex and we tested very young monkeys so we did not know how their visual or the, their other uh, ability will be able to support this uh, task, we added a control task where we have exactly the same five objects but this time we replaced three obje objects by three new objects. And when you test the animal uh, so first of all, for the control, what you can see that in a control task, because they were very short delay, they performed very well on all of the delays. 10 minutes? Oh, okay, you scared me. <laughs> okay. And, but if you look at now the uh, object in place, in place task, you can see that they are changed up to two years. It's only around three years of age that they start performing above chance level, and this is uh, significant here. So when you look at the animal with the neonatal lesion, now you can see that they are also performing quite well at, uh, uh, at short delays at this object control task, but now they show this impairment when they reach three and four years of age. And this is in fact following you know, the pattern of development of these two different circuits within the, of course this is just correlation, this is not causation, but I mean it seems to be quite interesting that it follow the pattern of what's happening in the morphological maturation of the hippocampus. All right, so now I'm going to change gears a little bit just to give you the flavor of what we do instead of going through all of the battery of tasks. And of course, uh, what we wanted to know, because we do this uh, lesion quite early in life, is how this uh, early lesion impact the uh, development of other uh, neural structure with which the uh, hippocampus is connected. The hippocampus has a very wide network and it was interesting to try to figure out how uh, this uh, early lesion could impact the full system here. So we have started some study with a group of neuroimager who are looking at GTI, resting state F fMRI, but the one I'm, go and we are in, a, in the process of examining all of this data here, but the one where we start to have some data are these metabolic pep 
PET imaging. And to do this study, I have focused on the, prefrontal, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex for several reasons, but two of them are because um, the earlier um, hypothesis from uh, Danny Warnberger about schizophrenia was that schizophrenia was maybe due to an event that could occur earlier in a hippocampus and could then trigger some changes in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And he has a rodent model for that. They've worked to show this, showing that neonatal uh, ventral hippocampal lesion in rodent uh, produce some deficit in working memory and changes in the prefrontal cortex of the rodents. So it was a very um, easy uh, first point to look. So what we did is first we tested this animal in some working memory task. And this we use some tasks developed by uh, Michael Petrides who look at lesion of this area on this type of task. So, one, so these are working memory tasks and you know that mo working mo memory includes several processes. You first have to maintain the information into a buffer and then you can monitor this information, how it occurred during time, or you can also manipulate the information into memory. So the uh, data from uh, Michael showed that while the maintenance could be supported by the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, the monitoring and the manipulation is very uh, linked to a DLPFC function. So we tested the, our animal in this task and what we found, I'm not going to present the data but just show you a summary, that if you use a self-order working memory task, the animal with neonatal hippocampal lesion are impaired in the task. They can maintain the information but they cannot monitor the information. They are also impaired in another task of temporal order memory. So with this in mind, we wanted to know whether the truly this uh, early lesion have impacted the dorsal lateral uh, prefrontal functioning. So we turned to a, a, a PET imaging study, a metabolic PET imaging study, where we trained the animal in two tasks. One, a recency working memory task that the animal has to do here. He has just to uh, remember which of these two objects he has, he has seen more recently. And this is the regular not matching to sample, which is more uh, uh, mediated by the middle temporal lobe. And uh, we did uh, uh, metabolic PET imaging during these two tasks. And here is an example of an animal, a control animal performing. So we subtracted the session unique, which is the working memory task, and the uh, um, trial unique, and you can see a very heavy activation here of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex in this animal. For the animal with the neonatal lesion, you can see that, that these um, areas are quite inactive, and it's in, in fact a bilateral activation here of the lateral prefrontal cortex. And this uh, activation in the, uh, in the, in the lesion group were very correlated with uh, their performance on the task. So we seems to show that these early lesion have impacted the uh, functioning or at least the maturation of the prefrontal cortex. Of course now it would be interesting to see uh, what all of this neural network is doing when you have this dysfunction of the hippocampus and this is where we are going. Do I have one minute to go? Good. <laughs> So let's go because there is a lot of uh, talk that have, uh, this afternoon about stress reactivity and the hippocampus and I just wanted to at least say a word on it here even though I cannot expand. So these animals have also been tested in some uh, uh, emotional task. Here it's a very well-known task which is called the human intruder when the monkey is, pl is placed alone in a room and an intruder uh, arrives in a room, the intruder could either uh, show the, uh, its profile and this usually during this condition the animal uh, react as a defensive gesture is going to pretend that it is not in a room and stay very quiet and inactive whereas um, when the intruder arrive and stare at the monkeys now the monkey uh, react with hostile gesture 
And so we tested uh, this animal in, in this task at a three time point. Unfortunately, if I would have known about the rodent work at the time, I would have tested them through adolescence also. It would have been nice, but unfortunately, I did not. And when they were adult, we even took you know, blood sample before at baseline and after the stressor just to look at cortisol level in this animal. So what we found here is, if you look, so this is when they are alone, the profile and the stare. This is the mean frequency of anxious behavior at two months, four months. You can see there is not too many changes between the lesion in purple and the control. But now when they were adult, you can see this elevated uh, frequency of anxious behavior that were in fact associated also with some increase of soothing behavior from the animal, trying to compensate by doing a lot of uh, touching their hands or uh, a lot of self-directed uh, behavior to try to calm down their anxiety. And if you look at this adult here, when you look you can see, sorry, you can see that at baseline, uh, the cortisol level were uh, similar in the control and in the lesion animal, but after the stressor, well, you can see that big rise here in cortisol in the control. Now you have a very flat uh, reactivity here in, in the animal with the lesion. So indicating that the lesion have really impacted the regulation of the HPA axis. I think I'm going to finish this. This is just a, a summary of what I have said all the way up to now. For those who are interested, sometimes people ask me, yeah, but your monkey are impaired in everything. And I say, no, because there are some tasks, for example, here, where we can see, see that they are better than a control. So there are some reorganization that, in fact, you know, are compensated by, in fact, you know, a, a greater you know, f functioning or better performance on tasks on these animals. And I would like to thank all of the uh, students and postdocs uh, that have worked on the, on, on the project and uh, also all of the agency that have supported this work. Thank you very much.